Good evening, everybody. My name is Joel Friedman. I'm the president of the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund, who's the sponsor for tonight's program. We want to welcome you to tonight's program, which is focusing on extreme storms. Thank you all for attending. Um, I do see, I believe, many distinguished scientists and researchers in the audi audience. If I may, could I ask for a show of hands for all the people who are involved in the STEM area? So a few, but probably the majority not. So this is a very you know, heavy subject. And since it is so heavy, and since we do have some science type people in the audience, I figured I'd first uh, lighten it up with a couple of um, scientist jokes. So. <laughs> Um, I was at Argonne last week, um, and I happened to be eavesdropping on two atoms that were taking a walk. And the first atom said to the other atom, uh, uh, I think I lost an electron. And the second one said, are you sure? And he says, yes, I'm positive. Okay. Uh, then after that, I was so depressed that I went into a bar, and there were uh, two chemists uh, who just walked into the bar, and as an unusual uh, circumstance, the bartender was also a, uh, a student uh, in chemistry. So the bartender asks uh, chemist one, what do you want to drink, what, what would you like to drink? And he says, uh, H2O. He says to the second uh, chemist, what would you like to drink? And he says, H2O2. So the Chemist, I mean, the bartender kind of rolls his eyes, uh, but reaches under the bar into a, a container, pours the guy the drink, and the second chemist dies. So, on that note, uh, let me continue. <laughs> uh, you got it. Uh, I say that the non-scientists, I should have said, look at their emails for, the, for those 30 seconds. The scientists get it. Uh, so, thank you for uh, the Chicago Public Library for hosting us here tonight. Uh, with tonight's program, C2ST is pleased to continue the collaboration with the Chicago Public Library and hopes to continue this for the foreseeable future. Um, to get a sense of our audience tonight, uh, can you raise your hand if this is your first C2ST event? Ah, many of you, and in that case, uh, for those of you that are new to Chicago Council on Science and Technology, it's a 10-year-old not-for-profit org organization that seeks to enhance the public's understanding and appreciation of science and technology. C2ST hosts about 30 free or low-cost programs throughout the year uh, on any and all science and technology topics. Uh, if any of you have what you feel are good ideas for programs, see, please see to C2ST staff that are here to give them those ideas. We're always looking for good programs. Um, C2ST is closing out its 10th year and is in, in running a Power of 10 campaign. You can make a $10 donation or much more uh, at the C2ST table outside or on C2ST's website please visit c2st.org or refer to the postcards um, on the tables for C2ST's upcoming programs. Sign up for the mailing list so you can get reminders about these programs in your email. Uh, these are very helpful. They come on regular times and there's some great programming, so I encourage you to do it. Now, to earn my very significant uh, speaking fee that I'm being paid today, uh, I have to inform you of some of the protocols for this evening. Number one, uh, during the Q&A, please respect those with hearing disabilities and wait for the microphone when you want to ask a question. Please remember to ask a question, not make a statement. If you do want to make a statement uh, uh, or make a speech instead of just asking the question, C2ST will be happy to consider you for a future program. Um, also, since the program is being audio recorded, your voice will only be audible if you use the microphone, so please use the microphone. Uh, please silence your cell phones, but we do encourage you to take pictures and post and tweet throughout the event. We do understand that President Trump will be tweeting here. Uh, we encourage you to use the conference app 
uh, to ask questions online and to upvote questions that you think are interesting. Please be sure to fill out the evaluations on the conference app. Again, that's c2st.cnf.io. You'll never remember that. Uh, after the program to let us know how you like the program and be entered to win one of the three-day passes for a spa. Nope, Morton Arboretum. Um, this program is being recorded so you can see any part of the talk, again, and share with your friends on Facebook and la later go to C2ST TV YouTube channel. I'm sure you're there all the time. Um, thank you for coming out to hear the important topic. At the Bomb Fund, we are ardent supporters of science and encourage scientists to step outside their comfort zone and advocate for their positions. It's critical for scientists to get out of their labs and speak out. Locally, the Bomb Fund is supporting IC at UIC, IES at Loyola, SIS at UIC, ELPC, and the BGA, uh, an enviro environmental investigative reporter there. Uh, if you're interested in any of these, you'll just have to look up the acronyms or see me after the program. We're delighted to bring you uh, this group of distinguished researchers that will go over the science behind global changes and how extreme weather patterns will be affected. I'm proud to introduce uh, the moderator for this evening, Eliz Elizabeth Koch. Uh, Elizabeth is the Director of Programming Outreach and Research, Outreach, Research and Education for the Energy Initiative at UIC. Uh, an adjunct prof assistant professor for urban planning and policy, and the faculty fellow for the Honors College at UIC, where the focus of her work is to develop and lead the strategic direction of the UIC Energy Initiative. She has an environmental behaviors, she is an environmental behavior scientist at the intersections of energy, technology, economics, society, and urban resilience, and her scholarly work spans environmental research on energy and sustainability perspectives and the built and human environments. As editor-in-chief for the Materials Research Society Energy and Sustainability Journal, Elizabeth, Elizabeth brings her unique interdisciplinary perspective to the journal's scope on energy and sustainability as it relates to the impact of materials on society. Elizabeth earned her bachelor's degree in architecture from Pratt Institute in New York and her PhD in environmental psychology from the City University of New York Graduate Center. Please welcome Elizabeth and enjoy the program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Friedman, for the warm welcome and introduction. I'd also like to thank C2ST for bringing together thought leaders to discuss the impact of extreme storms that are challenging cities around the world today. We have a very interesting topic tonight and experts um, lined up to discuss it. So um, without further ado, I just want to give a brief introduction to the topic and, and then I'll introduce the panelists. One at a time, they'll give a brief talk on some of the, the work that they do and then um, from there, we'll open it up for a moderated Q&A and then audience Q&A. So weather patterns around the world have been changing due in large part to global ch climate change. Drastic increases in rainfall, several year droughts, and an increase in the number of severe storms, such as hurricanes, tornadoes, are some of the observed effects thus far. Joining us tonight is a panel of experts. They're gonna talk about weather changes and the effects they are causing and may cause in the future. First up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Donald Wibbles from the University of Illinois. Dr. Wibbles is the Harry E. Preble Professor of Atmospheric Science at the University of Illinois. He is also a presidential fellow at the University of Illinois with an aim of helping the university system develop new initiatives in urban sustainability. From 2015 to early 2017, Dr. Robles was Assistant Director with the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the Executive Office of the President 
in Washington, D.C., where he was the White House expert on climate science. He served as the head of the Department of Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Illinois from 1994 to 2006, where he also led the development of the School of Earth, Society, and Environment. And he was its first director. Dr. Wobbles is an expert in atmospheric physics and chemistry with over 500 scientific publications related to the Earth's climate, air quality, and the stratospheric ozone layer. His work, however, extends well beyond that through providing analyses and development of metrics used in national and international policy and in developing analyses for understanding climate impacts on society and ecosystems, plus potential resilience and societal responses. He has also co-authored a number of international and national scientific assessments, including several international climate assessments by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which resulted in IPCC being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. He was a leader in both the 2013 IPCC International Assessment of Climate Science and the 2014 Third U.S. National Climate Assessment. More recently, he also co-led the Climate Science Special Report, a 475-page first volume of the fourth U.S. National Climate Assessment, published in November 2017, that assesses the science of climate change. Dr. Robles has also led special assessments of the impacts of climate change on human society and ecosystems for the U.S., Midwest, the Northeast, and a special assessment for the city of Chicago. At this time, please welcome Dr. Robles to the stage. Thank you all, and thank you, Elizabeth. Um, let me see if I can figure out how to uh, move this forward. There we go. Uh, so in just a few minutes, we're going to talk a little bit about climate change, but, um, but more importantly for this talk, what it means in terms of impacts on severe weather. What you see there is the cover from the executive summary from the first volume of the fourth national climate assessment. Um, and copies of that uh, can be had. Um, and in fact, if you send me an email, I will, I will make sure that one gets sent to you. Um, I have one copy with me today if someone wants it, but, uh, uh, but otherwise we'll have to mail them. Um, so what, what is that telling us? So, I'm just, so it's a very quick summary. Our climate is changing you know, in the United States, throughout the world. It's happening now. It's happening extremely rapidly. In fact, it's happened about 10 times faster than nature tends to change the Earth's climate system. So this is a really important event that's going on. But it's not just global warming, as the media likes to call it. It's much more than that, which is why scientists for many decades have called this climate change instead, uh, because sea levels are rising, and we're seeing these significant changes in severe weather, where severe weather is becoming more intense. And this is going to continue to happen over the coming decades. So. Hopefully this shows up well enough, but uh, because of my screen here, it looks awful, but it looks better up there. Um, one of the ways we know that, that things are happening is what is, uh, since 1980, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration uh, has been tracking what are called the billion dollar severe weather and climate events in the, in the U.S. And it used to be that we had a couple such events per year. Now we're seeing something well over 10 such events. In fact, if we looked at 2016, there were 15 such events, and 2017 was the, uh, was the bit worst year on record with, with uh, uh, 16 such events and about $300 billion worth of damage uh, in the U.S. And this is just infrastructure damage. This doesn't include lives and other aspects, and it only accounts events over a billion dollars. But over this entire time, we've seen an impact on the U.S. economy of about $1.5 trillion uh, so over the last 37 years. So if someone tells you that climate change doesn't affect me, well, it is. It's affecting your pocketbook, if nothing else, um, and, and you just don't realize it. 
Because we've now gone from just a few events per year to uh, a much more significant number of such events each year. And we're seeing the same kind of trends globally, by the way. There's a number of organizations that have been looking at the, the global trends as well. So what's happening with extreme events? Well, heat waves are generally increasing throughout the US and, and significantly in, in worldwide, uh, both in number and in intensity. Cold waves generally are decreasing. More precipitation is coming as larger events. I'm going to kind of concentrate on that tonight because that's an impact we're definitely seeing here in the Midwest uh, and it's having an impact on, on uh, our lives already. As a result, we're seeing an increasing risk of floods in some parts of the, in some regions of the United States, particularly in the Northeast and the Midwest and throughout the world similarly, um, if you look at the same aspects. Interestingly though, as we'll talk about, is that we're also seeing an increasing intensity of droughts in some regions. And uh, we're particularly seeing that in the U.S. in the Southwest and Southeast. Incidents of large wildfires have increased. We're seeing an increasing intensity of hurricanes and then scientific analysis tell us that that's going to get only more so in the future. Not in terms of number, but in terms of intensity. Tornado activity, the jury's still out on because we just don't have enough data. We are seeing, though, an increase in outbreaks. And when, when, more, when we do get a tornado, it's more likely to be a number of them in the same region. And from a new paper from one of my students that was just uh, recently accepted by a journal, uh, although the hail data is rather poor, we do seem to be seeing an increased intensity in hail uh, over the recent decades as well. Now, if Going back to the extreme precipitation, uh, there's a number of different ways one can look at extreme precipitation, but we are seeing over the past decades a significant increase in, in precipitation through, throughout most of the country uh, and throughout most of the world. Even in the dry areas, when, it's, when you do get precipitation, either rain or snow, it's more likely to be a larger event than it was in the past. That's not surprising because the basic physics tells us that a warmer atmosphere should hold more water vapor. And as a result, uh, when, when that water is available to be evaporated and put into the atmosphere, it's more likely to rain or snow as a larger event. What we see on the, uh, this is two different ways of looking at it, by the way. This is a one in five year event uh, across uh, the United States and a, and a two day precipitation. Two-day precipitation events, one in five-year reoccurrence. And then on the right-hand side shows what if the top 1% events since 1958, when we seem to have gotten roughly the best data um, to, starting about then uh, for the United States and going uh, to, recent, to 2016, we've, we've seen a 42% increase in such top 1% events in, in the uh, uh, occurrence of such events in, in the Midwest. Now, when you get these extreme rainfall events, you're more likely to see more flash floods. I and mean, that's definitely a problem where I live in Champaign-Urbana, uh, where uh, the viaducts are almost constantly uh, flooded now when, after we get one of these large rainfall events. Finally, I'm going to show you a result from uh, a new paper one of my students is doing. And uh, it's kind of complex, so I'm just going to concentrate primarily on the right-hand side, which shows you results from uh, regional modeling of studies. So when we look at global modeling studies, that tend to be a coarse resolution. We try to go to a much higher resolution, 12-kilometer resolution. And when we do that, we, we get a much better representation of uh, precipitation patterns across the United States. Um, but on top of that, we start seeing uh, some, some interesting things happen. You kind of see them with the global model, but not to the same degree. Largely, what we're seeing is that more precipitation is likely to be in the top 5% of the events than before. But at the same time, the average, rain, you know, the average rainfall event is decreasing. So the very small events tend to be in, decreasing in number. And as we project forward to the end of the century, that could seem more, more the case. At the same time, the no rainfall days in many parts of the country are likely to increase, uh, such that we have the situation when it does rain, 
our snow is more likely to be a larger event, but in between, you're likely to have more miniature droughts, or in some cases in the West, large significant droughts. And, uh, and we're, um, so these results are telling us a lot about more details about uh, what is happening with um, this extreme rainfall. And uh, Liz will be talking a little bit more. Finally, I want to end on the question of intense hurricanes. Tropic, tropical cyclones get their energy from the warm surface layer of the ocean, which is getting warmer and deeper. And as a result, more ocean energy means stronger cyclones. That's the kind of the basic physics. And the result is that we're projecting increases in precipitation rates, intensity of these hurricanes, and the number of very intense tropical cyclones is likely to increase, but the total number of hurricanes is not likely to change much. And I'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you, Don, for the presentation. Our next panelist is Dr. Elizabeth Moyer from the University of Chicago. Dr. Moyer is an associate professor in the Department of Geo Geophysical Sciences and the director of the Center for Robust Decision Making on Climate and Energy Policy at the University of Chicago. She co-directs the center which is an NSF-funded interdisciplinary center focused on open source tools to support decision making. Dr. Moyer's research spans at atmospheric science, climate statistics, and energy and climate policy analysis. Her climate research focuses on the statistics of evolving climate states. Her atmospheric science research focuses on the processes that control the distribution of water vapor and the formation of cirrus clouds in the upper troposphere and stratosphere. She holds both an AB in anthropology, archeology, span and a BS in physics with honors from Stanford University and a PhD in planetary science from the California Institute of Technology. Please extend a warm welcome to Dr. Elizabeth Moyer. So Don has told you a lot about uh, projections uh, and the summary of projections of the National Climate Assessment. Uh, I want to make sure that we have some fundamentals, so I'm going to turn to sort of the principles behind the reasons, the reasons why some of these changes are forecast to occur. Um, and I want to remind you of some of the complexities that happen when we talk about precipitation extremes or extreme weather. So. The word extreme is a colloquial English word that can mean a lot of different things. This is an image of a precipitation time series from a single gauge. It's several years. You can see the changes up and down. It's daily precipitation. Most of the days actually have zero precip. Um, when we define an extreme, we have to say, what is it about that time series? What aspect of a changing time series would we call an extreme? We can talk about multiple spatial scales, we can talk about multiple time scales. When people talk about precipitation extremes, in many cases they're talking about a very localized measurement on a time scale of hours or days. You can also aggregate up and talk about precipitation on a basin scale or higher. And what you call an extreme in those two contexts can be quite different, and how they relate to human impacts can be quite different. For a flash flood, obviously local precipitation matters. If you're worried about large-scale flooding on the Mississippi, what you care about is precipitation aggregated over several days or weeks even over a much larger region. So when we talk about an extreme, we always have to be mindful of the fact that this is a a term that can be defined in many different ways, and we have to think about the differences in the scales. So in order to define an extreme, people typically take a time series, and they turn it into what we call marginal distribution. But those, again, are also strongly affected by the scale on which we look. This is a marginal distribution of precipitation on a three-hour time scale. We're looking at models now because I'm showing you present and a future version. The y-axis is the 
you can think of it as a measure of the number of days that have a certain value of precipitation falling in one location uh, in a three hour window. You can see that most of the days have zero precip, or most of the time periods have zero precip. That's just a nature. Precipitation is statistically very hard to characterize because on most, uh, most of the time it's not raining. Right? So it's a high zero uh, uh, distribution. Um, in this case, I'm showing you a model 10 years. Uh, the present is in blue, the future is in red. Uh, one of the challenges of analyzing anything, uh, uh, observations or projections, is trying to characterize in some, in some summary statistic what the behavior is of a complicated distribution. In this case, you would have to ask, how will I know whether that distribution is different is it significant? Are there changes at the tails of the distribution that would matter? You can see there's a few red points that are, that are extreme changes, but you'd have to ask, are these statistically significant? Am I confident that this is meaningful? When we scale up in space, things get a lot simpler. Now I'm going to show you precipitation, same two time periods. So this is present and then sort of 10 or 30 years around the 2100 period. Uh, this is a much larger time spatial scale. This is the central North America, the part that includes Chicago. Now I'm showing you annual precipitation. You can see the distributions look quite different. Uh, the blue again is the present, the red is the future, and the black that I'm showing you here is, is simply um, is the blue distribution scaled by the fractional mean change. So what this tells you is that when you talk about changes in extremes, you have to think hard about what you mean. Do you mean just a shift in the mean value? Do you mean a shift in the shape of the distribution? Are you interested in the standard deviation? Are you interested in the tails? These definitions all matter a great deal. So there's a huge diversity in what we might call an extreme. And this is even the case where we're still talking about analysis of time series. But precipitation, when we think about the factors that lead to rainfall, it's not something that occurs on the spatial scale of, of a rain gauge, and it's not something that's uniform across an entire basin. Uh, it's a much more complicated process, which I'll show you in just a minute, uh, the details of the spatial temporal distribution. So it's a reminder that the definition of an extreme is complicated, and I want to do one simple physical explanation for why both rainfall goes up in a future climate and why the intensity of rainfall goes up. So this, if you take nothing else away, I would like to leave you with an understanding of why it rains more under future climate change. So the Earth's climate is basically a mechanism, the way in which the planet balances its energy. Sunlight comes in, source of energy falls on the ground. The Earth has to get rid of that energy. It gets rid of it by glowing it back out to space as infrared radiation. What CO2 does, if you look at the moon, the amount of energy coming back at infrared, infrared radiation at the surface exactly balances the sunlight at all times. On the Earth, that isn't the case because the constituents in our atmosphere make it difficult for the surface to shed energy by radiation. So what the surface does, it glows a little bit of infrared out, but mostly what it does is it sheds its energy what we, through what we call the latent heat. Basically, the Earth sweats. Just as you would if you put on a blanket that made it hard for you to shed heat, you would sweat to get rid of that extra energy. So rainfall you can think of as the Earth's sweat falling back down, which I know is sort of gross, but that's actually what it does. So why does it rain more in the future? Because the atmosphere gets thicker with CO2, it's harder to shed energy through infrared radiation, and so you get more of that energy that goes out through evaporating water, which means more of that water falls down. So in the future, the, the more opaque the atmosphere, the more the Earth is going to sweat. I, think, I know it is, is, feels vile to people to think of rainfall as the Earth's sweat, but it's exactly the analogy. What rainfall is doing is it's helping the surface cool. OK, so now there is an interesting factor, factoid that the global change in precipitation is not at all the same as the local change in the precipitation. So this extra need to dump energy through evaporating water produces a change in global rainfall of about 1% to 2% per degree change at the surface. But as Don told you, the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere increases by a different amount, by a much higher amount, by 6 to 7% per degree. So this second number, that describes the extra intensity of an individual event. When it's raining, how much more rainfall do you get? 
you get six to seven percent on average per degree of warming uh, at the surface. But the global rainfall goes up by less. It goes up, but not by as much. So that means something very strange is happening to all of our storms. There must be something different that accommodates these different changes. So either the storms are becoming slightly less frequent, or they're becoming shorter, or they're becoming smaller. And you have to have that in order to have it rain six or seven percent per degree more when it's raining, and yet only one to two percent more overall. So we know we have these very complicated changes in weather that are part of this process of evolution that's happening. We know that this process is the dominant factor by which the surface sheds energy. So this is a major change imposed by adding CO2 to the atmosphere. But when we try to characterize that, it's hard. So this I'm showing you just to get a sense of the complexity of what rainfall really looks like. A rain gauge, you think that's hard enough, but this is an actual field. If you look at the lower left panel, that is the best version we have of surface rainfall from all of our weather stations and, rain and radar stations across the United States. It doesn't cover the West Coast. You can see a little bit of slice there because the stations aren't complete enough, but for all of that white area, that's essentially reality. That's the amount of rain falling at any given time. This is two months of actual observations in that panel uh, in 2005, June and July. The panel just above it is our representation of that in sort of our aggregate, what we call reanalysis, which is our best sort of integrated measurements. And then all of the four panels are model runs, regional model runs, driven by that reanalysis. So they are attempts of our local fine scale models to reproduce reality. They're supposed to be producing exactly what's in that lower uh, left hand panel. And if the models were perfect, all of those five panels would look identical. And what you can see is they're kind of not, right? These are the best versions of fine scale regional models that we have. We're trying to understand local precipitation features and it's really hard. This is just not something that models can do well. Um, they can do some things. You'll see at one point in this, you'll see hurricanes coming in. You might have seen one march through already. There's two hurricanes in this time period, Hurricane Cindy and Hurricane Dennis. And all of the models versions capture the fact that a hurricane exists. But that doesn't mean they get every feature of it correct. So when we talk about precipitation in the future, we have to remember that the local details are hard for us to get. OK, so I want to mention one more aspect, which is when we analyze precipitation, uh, what we have done in my group is try to go away from the rain gauge perspective and say, if we want to understand extremes in real precipitation systems, we need to analyze these kind of storm systems, not just what it does at one location, but this entire field. And so I've been working with a multitude of people in different fields. All of these figures come from papers that were led by a former postdoc who's now a faculty member in statistics at the University of Cincinnati, Wan Chang. The runs were done by our colleagues at Argonne, uh, Rao Kautamurthy and Jali Wang. So there's many people who've been involved in this, in this work. But I just want to show you some of what you can try to do to make a different kind of statistics to say what ha really happens to individual events. It means we have to first define the event, and then we say, how in the future does this event change? And what we actually find is that most of this amount intensity discrepancy is compensated for by storms getting smaller, physically smaller, especially in the summertime, which is a benefit. Uh, it's extremely good news for us regionally at basin scale because it means that even though an individual storm is much more intense, the storm is physically not so large in extent. Uh, however, for something like the city of Chicago, where we are a small location being hit by a single storm, we don't get any refuge from that six to seven percent per K. So, so the impacts of extreme weather on people depend very strongly on what scale we're talking about. And so I wanted to bridge here to Marcelo because he's gonna tell you what happens when a storm of that increased intensity uh, falls on the city of Chicago. Thank you, Dr. Moyer. Our final panelist this evening is Dr. Marcelo Garcia from the University of Illinois. Dr. Marcelo Garcia is the M.T. Jeffrey Ye Chair in Civil Engineering and the Director of the Venta Chow Hydro Systems Laboratory at the University of Illinois. 
He's a distinguished member of the American Society of Engineers, ASCE, and a fellow of their Environmental Water Resources Institute. Dr. Garcia is also the founding director of the Centro Internacional de Grandes Rios in UNL Santa Fe, Argentina. He served as editor of the International Journal of Hydraulic Research and served as editor-in-chief of the ASCE Manual of Engineering Practice 110, Sedimentation Engineering. In 2005, he was elected corresponding member of the National Academy of Engineering of Argentina. Dr. Garcia's work as it relates to water challenges in the state of Illinois include developing physical models of the Boneyard Creek in Urbana, which led to a solution for its flooding problem. He redesigned low head dams on the Chicago, Fox, and Vermilion rivers to reduce the number of drowning accidents and designed canoe chutes for the same dams in order to increase safe recreational use of Illinois streams. He has also worked with the US Army Corps of Engineers to mitigate navigation problems caused by sedimentation and vegetation in the upper Mississippi River Basin, as well as with the Chicago River control structure controlling the diversion of water from Lake Michigan and Chicago. Dr. Garcia also served in the expert review board for the Fargo-Moorhead Flood Protection Scheme. Since 2003, he has led a major effort to develop hydro hydrological and hydraulic models of the tunnel and reservoir plan being built in the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago. Please welcome Dr. Garcia to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction and happy to be, uh, to be here. And uh, what I'm going to do is um, Don and Lisa talk about precipitation in general and climate change and all the things that are going on, and you already got a, an idea that um, of the complexity uh, of what we are talking about. Now I'm going to go to a much smaller scale, uh, all the way down to uh, the ground level, and try to uh, talk a little bit about um, what does it mean when the rain uh, literally hits the ground. Um, one of the biggest challenges that the world is facing because of all these uh, changes has to do with um, urban flooding. So urban flooding in general, um, if you look at the top 100 cities or above 100 cities in the world, largest cities in the world, um, the projected rise from uh, losses associated with uh, floods, with flooding, uh, has gone from six billion in 2005 to is projected to get to up to 52 billion dollars by the year 20, uh, 2050. So here in Chicago, we are quite aware of, of what does it mean, what what flooding uh, uh, means. What you see here on your left is um, these are claims by zip code of people who have had uh, problems uh, with flooding. Um, Basement flooding, as we know, is a, is a common uh, problem. And then on the hand, right hand side, you see some of the claims I have done in terms of dollars with FEMA on disaster prevention, as well as the national insurance um, uh, program. So flooding, uh, for instance, in one south side uh, Chicago community, um, between the year 2007 and 2011, uh, they have been damaged uh, claims amounting to the order of $50 million. So this is, this, is an important, um, this is an important problem. That is not just the issue of the water itself and, and how much it ruins and, and the damage that it causes, but also is a, the impact that it has on communities' uh, health, on the health of different communities that once you experience one of these um, uh, flooding events, um, the stress, the anxiety that, that creates um, it's, it's, uh, it's large, it's important. So it has an effect that um, impacts communities as a, as a whole, and, and that's why it is important to take uh, notice of this. So there is a concept that was started about a few years ago in Europe, and the whole idea of transforming cities into sponge cities. And the whole concept is, the idea is that what can you do um, to actually uh, make sure that um, you can 
create areas that will provide enough infiltration of that rainfall that hits the ground, and the ground itself, the soil, will be able to absorb uh, that water. Because the more water you can absorb, the less runoff you're going to produce, the volume of runoff is going to come out. So you see here uh, green roofs, a uh, different location, and here you see a list of all the benefits that green infrastructure uh, can bring along. It's not a panacea either. It's not that it's going to solve all the problems, but in many communities at the local level, uh, the amount of uh, impervious areas that we have is so large that having areas that can absorb water is very, very, um, uh, very, very important. And also has other values that, um, that help make this approach, the approach of a sponge uh, city, uh, a notable one that one could try to, um, uh, to follow. As many of you might know, one of the biggest issues in Chicago has to do with the fact that, uh, and Chicago land in general, uh, has the fact that we have a combined sewer system. So what that means is that when it, when it rains, the water that comes off the yards and off the houses and off the streets and, and drains into a, into a sewer, um, it gets combined with the, house, the, the, the water that is coming out of residential areas uh, out of different facilities when people are basically uh, following their everyday uh, life. So that combined sewer system, for as long as you have normal weather conditions, what we call dry weather conditions, things go okay because the water simply drains through these pipes, goes to an interceptor, and from that interceptor it gets sent to a wastewater treatment plant. In the Chicago area we have seven wastewater treatment plants in total. Now, when it starts to rain and you have a storm condition, that things begin to change because now if you only, uh, that interceptor, the wastewater treatment plant, has only has a certain capacity of how much water it can take. So when that capacity is overwhelmed, is surpassed, the water then starts to go into, into the river. And it's a combination of rainfall and basically um, uh, wastewater, uh, sewage. If it rains too much, like we were talking about a minute ago, if we have a stream storm now, and the system is really overwhelmed, well, not only you're going to have a lot more water going into the river, but also you're going to have a lot of water just backing up into uh, the residential system, the residential areas, and that's when you begin to experience um, uh, basement flooding. And this goes, historically goes way back when Chicago, after the, the, the big fire, Afterwards, they decided to lay out the pipes on the streets, basically the sewers, and just put dirt on top, go up by 10 feet, and just keep going. So what was your, the first floor of your house became your basement, literally, in many areas of, of the city. So what came about in the early 1970s, when the EPA uh, is created, um, new norms come along, and Chicago tries to come up with a solution to the combined sewer uh, uh, problem. And that solution became the so-called tunnel and reservoir plan, okay? And this is, has, been going, uh, has been undergoing construction since the 1970s. So what you can see here is basically uh, a cutout, a profile, a cross-section of the system. This would be your wastewater treatment plant. Uh, this is a river, this can be another river or the lake itself. But here what you have, essentially, uh, when it rains now, uh, the water uh, essentially goes into the same sewers, interceptors that I showed you before, and it goes into the wastewater treatment plant. Now, when that capacity is overwhelmed, now that is, gets dropped into a system of tunnels. There is 100 miles of tunnels under, under the city, 160 kilometers of tunnels, okay, that basically collect all that water and they hold that water, they provide underground storage until the storm goes away, and then that water gets pumped back into the wastewater treatment plant and gets put back into, into the river after it's treated. But also you do get extreme storm events that we have seen in which uh, the tunnel, uh, indeed, the deep tunnel cannot take any more water there are also reservoirs, that is, that's why it's called the Tunnel and Reservoir Plan, because there are major uh, reservoirs, McCook, 
third one, and there is a smaller one at the here. So that water basically can go through those reservoirs, and you have to hold it there. But those reservoirs can fill up as well, depending on the intensity of the storm. And if that's the case, then eventually you're going to have to go back to the river. And in some cases, you need to let the water go back into, um, into, the, uh, into the lake. And the reason is that if the river is too high now, and because you can't get enough water going into Lake Michigan, and you can't get enough water going into Lockport, if the water level in the river is too high, then you are backing up the whole system. So when you get long, prolonged storms, uh, or when you get storms that um, stop raining, then it rains for a while again, and it keeps raining some more, and the ground gets saturated, you lose the capacity to infiltrate. And even though you might have a substantial amount of green infrastructure in place, um, you lose that capacity to abstract that water, and everything that basically comes down in the form of precipitation becomes then runoff. So one of the things that we, we've been doing now for about a decade is to try to put together models uh, that allow us to basically take the rainfall, use that as an input to our system, and then do the hydraulics of the system and basically figure out where is the water going, um, what is the drainage uh, doing, and where, what can we do to actually uh, figure out how the system is, is working. And we call this, this particular set of programs, we call it MetroFlow, uh, because we did it with the support with the Metropolitan Water Reclamation uh, uh, District. So the whole idea here that we see in this cartoon, this schematic, is that you're going to take the rain, and the rain, like Liz just showed a minute ago, it doesn't happen all the time, all the time with the same intensity and the same duration. That changes dramatically. So we're going to take that rain, and that rain, we're going to input it into our system, and we're going to route it through. And what you see here, this curve, is what we call a hydrograph. That's basically a plot of flow discharge, volume per unit time, as a function of time. And you can see that you're always getting these peaks as you move through the system. So it rains, the water goes down, some water is coming off uh, houses, some water is from runoff, all that water gets connected, you go to an interceptor. If this tunnel here can take it, this drop shaft, you go to the treatment plant, but when the capacity of this is overwhelmed, you keep going, and now you drop into the deep tunnel, into TARP, but at some point TARP might fill too if it rains after many days and you cannot pump back to uh, the treatment plant, so eventually you might have to go uh, and use the river for conveying that water through. So what this model does, MetroFlow, basically routes the rainfall through the system uh, with a series of models that allow us to say, well, for this type of event, how much precipitation um, or how much uh, runoff uh, we are going to get. There's one particular storm, the September 2008 storm that created a lot of problems because on record uh, the, the rain gauge in uh, the hair registered on the order of 6.64 inches of rain and that was on September 13th. That was the worst since 1871, you know, the year of the Great Fire, ever since uh, people have been measuring um, rain. And you can see O'Hare here, this uh, United Airlines uh, flight that is trying to reach the friendly skies but that's a lot of water on the, on the uh, runaway. Here you see parts of the city where you see a lot of water accumulating. So even though we have, we have all this infrastructure, which is fantastic, the deep tunnels, we have created a system that really affords us the possibility of trying to uh, harness Mother Nature in the, in the terms of how much uh, rainfall um, runoff we can, we can haul. At the same time, uh, we still have problems of conveyance at the, at the ground level, depending on the intensity of the precipitation. So this particular storm of 2008 is what we call a one in a hundred years uh, type of uh, storm because it was tremendous. These bands that you see here, we are able to build up with my students, basically using all the information from different rain gauges. Okay, this is a precipitation that actually reach the ground, and you can see that there are vans where in those areas the accumulated amount of rain, it was, it was uh, different. Now, you might say, why is that important? Well, because depending on, this is a plan view of the system, 
that is basically this. This is the Plains River. This is the north branch of the Chicago River. Here is the Albany Park area. Uh, here you see the North Shore Channel. Wilmette is there. The Baha'i Temple is there. You come down the north branch. This is downtown. You, you hit the main stem of, of um, the Chicago River. And if you keep going south, okay, you go into the south branch. This is the infamous Bubbly Creek. Racine Avenue Pump Station is there. And you keep going through the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal until you go all the way down uh, to Lockport and the displays on this side. So whatever you see there in blue, this is the deep tunnel, which was built 300 feet underground, 100 meters underground, because the geology that we have is really a blessing that we have. This was a whole glaciated area. So the rock that we have, the dolomite that we have deep down is excellent for boring uh, tunnels. So in that sense, because of legal issues, right away issues, the tunnels are, were bored under the streams in the city. So all these dots that you see there indicates that this particular storm of 2008 generated CSOs, excess amount of water, in all these dots that you see here. So out of 207 drop shafts, which is when you drop into the deep tunnel, we predicted with our model, with MetroFlow, that about 100 of those uh, had CSOs. CSOs is combined sewer overflows, and then about 86 of them uh, were, um, uh, were reported. So we have a lot of data modeling gaps. So when you're trying to understand how a system like this responds, depending on the distribution of the rain, both in space and in time, it's very, very important to have data. So one of the ways of ground truth in models, obviously, is with, with rain gauge uh, data, but then you also have to have flow measurements in different uh, places. So high resolution observations of, of flooding conditions um, are not easy to get, and they are, they are actually uh, needed if we want to continue to evolve and, and improve in, uh, our ability to actually pro protect and predict flood. So you have the rainfall, you have the cityscape, everything that you have, and then you have the interceptors, the combined sewers, and then you go all the way down to the deep tunnel to a uh, uh, tarp. So if you want to do that sequence at different levels, at all these levels, we need to have different levels of, of data. So one of the things that we have thought about is about the need to have what we call a Chicago Hydrologic Observatory um, that goes coupled with the network of sensors. So the idea that we need to not just observe the weather, but we have to monitor what is happening to the water. So usually in hydrology, what you like to be able to do is the so-called hydrologic budget. So you want to know how much rainfall you got, how much infiltration you got, how much evapotranspiration you have, how much runoff you got, how much water percolated deeper into the ground and was going to recharge the groundwater. All those variables, all those processes are important, and we need, we need that if we want to be improve the level of protection. At the street level, at the community level, we need to have more sensors because we do have this combined sewer system. So we need to be able to measure how much water accumulates on the streets, what is going on, because there is a need to have that kind of data at the ground level, not just what uh, we get from the weather data from next uh, RAD, for example. So having an integrated sensor network, this could be extremely helpful. Um, uh, for Chicago land in general, because it would allow us to tell if we, need, we do build any green infrastructure, what is the impact of that truly on the volume of runoff and in reducing uh, flood, uh, flooding hazards. So <clears throat> I seem to be going the other way. So here, here we have a, a, what we call, this would be the ideal thing to have, okay, a real-time uh, stormwater management system. That, you know, Tom um, Skilling is telling you that there is a, a storm coming, you see the weather coming, uh, you have a radar, Doppler radar that tells you how much water at least is coming in the atmosphere, the lower atmosphere, and then you have a number of algorithms that allow you to convert that in what you think, how much water is going to hit the ground at a particular location, and then you have all these models that allow you to make predictions on the fly, or you can train machine learning models uh, using the deterministic models that I show you. 
And then you can begin to say, well, how do we need to operate the system? What gates need to be open? What needs to be closed? Uh, what do we need to do at Lockport? What do we need to do at the lake uh, front? What do we need to do at Lockport in order to handle this the best possible way and truly minimize the impact of the storm on the, on the system and on the people living in the, in the area? And this is one of the most important parts, the, the educational part, the community engagement part. There are programs like the Rain Ready program by the City Center for Neighborhood Technology has been working for a long time in trying to prepare communities for flooding. There are some locations uh, where um, flooding is endemic, and a lot of that has to do with, well, uh, communities coming up in areas that, to start with, they were in low-lane areas, so their propensity to flood is much higher than other areas that might have been um, uh, higher up. So we need, to, uh, we need to have things like to educate these virtual hydrologic centers that we have, what we call the Alina uh, uh, Virtual Hydrologic Cycle Simulator, where you act actually can show um, the community, you can show children and everybody for that matter, what is a water cycle and how do we affect the water cycle, not just at the large scale, but at the smaller scales, the scales that we have on the, at the ground level, at the community level. So, with that, I finish my part of the, of the presentation, and I think we're going to now. Uh, this is, a, by the way, it's a picture of, of the old uh, uh, Chicago um, there in the, in the background. Thank you. So we are going to start with the moderated Q&A. Um, I'm going to have a couple of questions for all of you. Um, and the first one I'm going to talk about is, is um, so this 2008 storm seems to be the indicator um, for Chicago, at least about what we know and what we don't know about rainfall and flooding in this area. So from the various scales, I'll ask Don to talk about the global scale. Um, I'll ask Liz to talk about the regional scale and um, Marcelo to talk about the local scale. What are you most certain about and most uncertain about uh, when it comes to storms? That the worst storm you see today will be far surpassed in the future. And uh, so you talk about the 2008 storm being extremely unusual. It's a little bit like talking about the 1996 heat wave, which was also extremely unusual. And yet in our analyses, um, we, we think that, we, that kind of events can become common, you know, once every other year or as much as two or three times per year and in, by the end of the century. So, uh, so what's unusual today in terms of intense weather events is likely to become uh, more intense in the future. And that's very useful to the kind of analysis Marcelo does because that provides the kind of information they need to say, how do they build it for the next generation of, of issues? How, just time-wise, you said we're going to be way surpassed. How, how soon do you think that might happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're certainly going to, you know, so what we're, when we're looking at climate change, we're looking at the long-term statistical uh, averages and, and variations in weather. And so, um, you know, I can't say, oh, well, you're, you're going to see uh, a huge storm uh, by 2021 or something, but, but certainly we expect statistically that the, the likelihood of bigger storms, bigger rainfalls, uh, is ever increasing uh, as the climate continues to change. Um, as Liz mentioned, it does depend on just how much further temperature change we have, which in the end means how much further are we going to emit carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases and particles. But, um, but we can certainly expect to be seeing bigger and bigger storms over the next decade or so. Thank you. Liz? So it was what am I most certain about and then? Uh, uncertain about. OK. So uh, what we're most certain about, a little bit what Don was saying is that 
the hydrological cycle gets pumped up, this becomes even more a dominant way that the Earth's surface dumps its heat, and therefore we're going to have more rainfall when we have an event. Um, the stronger the, the warming, the more CO2 we have in the atmosphere, the, the more we'll start to notice this discrepancy between the mean rainfall going up and the strength of individual events, and we'll see changes in weather of some sort. But we don't understand yet what they are. Um, we have these model indications, but reality will, will, will soon teach us what the real answer is. Um, there are a lot of features of local weather that we're quite uncertain about. Here in Chicago in the upper Midwest, we're especially subject to the position of the jet stream. And this is one of those things, the behavior of the jet stream in the future is something that models can tell you what they guess, but it's not necessarily something models do well. And as we go forward, well, again, we're going to see reality play out to understand how much uh, any potential change in jet stream behavior begins to, to moderate our local weather here in the upper Midwest. So stronger storms, uh, changes in the structure of storms, either in their size, like we're finding, or in duration or in frequency. You know, the reality's got to do something. Um, so more individual flooding events. Um, we don't fully know what happens out of the very tails of individual extreme events because statistically they're so hard to capture. Um, and we don't know how this is going to be moderated by changes in the jet stream. Just to follow up on that, then, so the modeling, then, how, re how reliable is it then to... I wouldn't talk about models being reliable or unreliable. It's more that there's things that they do extremely well, and then there's things that are just difficult, and they're hard to ask a numerical simulation to, to do. Um, anything involving storms and formation of clouds is an incredibly difficult problem for a numerical simulation because you're trying to get it to represent a process whose spatial scale goes down to the size of an individual raindrop. And you can't do that, you know, unless you have the biggest supercomputer in the world is not going to be able to do that. So rare events of something that you can only capture in core scale are just a really tough proposition. So the, the global energy balance issues, uh, big regional changes, big patterns, common sense rules of thumb like these, you know, it's going to be warmer at the poles and at the equator, the hydrological cycle gets pumped up. These are all things that are extremely robust. There's really no way we can break those projections, but exactly how it rains over Chicago versus over Milwaukee in the year 2100, that's a hard ask. Thank you. Marcelo, about the local, what are you most certain about and what are you most uncertain about? Well, I'm certain that it's going to rain. See, <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm sorry. I'm certain that it's going to rain and uh, the question is, uh, how much, when, and, and where. So what, what is happening is that, as uh, the colleagues here have explained, um, from the point of view of, of the hydrologic engineering, usually you like to characterize uh, rainfall events by intensity. That's how many inches of rain you get per hour, or millimeters of rain per hour. Duration, how long was the event? And frequency, how often does it happen? So what we are seeing is that, for instance, large parts of uh, Chicago, the sewer systems were designed uh, for certain storms with a certain duration, a certain frequency, and, and intensity. And therefore, we cannot expect that that system, uh, when we get something that surpasses those characteristics, is going to uh, perform well. So there is going to be excess water that we are going to have to we're going to have to deal with. So I believe that the best way uh, of going about this is has to do with what we would say uh, an adaptive uh, hydrologic management. In other words, we need to adapt to the fact that the conditions are going to continue to, uh, to change. So even though we might have a lot of infrastructure that helps us from the water balance at the scale of Cook County handle uh, large uh, storms, we still are going to have to deal at the local level with different communities, neighborhoods that are going to experience problems that are going to have to be solved more at the local, at the local level. So that's why I, I pose the, uh, the question of green infrastructure uh, versus gray infrastructure. 
and how those two need to be combined uh, with, with management, with stormwater management, to be able to say, well, you're trying to find uh, solutions that are going to help you stay um, relatively dry. Thank you. Um, just to follow up on that, then, because the green infrastructure is that so much so important for planning for the future. How do you plan for it? How do you design um, the green in infrastructure? What are its facilities and limitations? Well, the limitations is that, for instance, or the, the advantage is that you look at green roofs. I show you some slides of green roofs. Green roofs, well, have the advantage of um, not just absorbing a lot of water that otherwise would be coming down the, the gutter very, very quickly. So it retains that water and releases it very, very slowly. So you can think of a green roof as being the perfect sponge, like I mentioned, the sponge city, because it has a certain capacity to absorb that water. And it's not that water is not going to come out of there, because gravity is going to bring it down to the lower layers of the green roof, and it's going to uh, drain out. But it's going to come out of the roof at the speed that the system downstream can take it, the gutters downstream can take it. So the same thing happens at the, at the city scale or at the neighborhood scale. If you have ways to slowing down the water so that it doesn't come so quickly off people yards or roofs, buildings, what have you, parks, um, that means that the, the system of pipes that you have, the sewers that you have, are going to be able to take that amount of water because at the rate at which the water is going to be coming through is going to be smaller. Thank you. Just to follow up on that, and um, I guess my earlier question for Don, uh, how, how do we know that the deep tunnel or the tunnel and reservoir system itself is going to be adequate uh, if we can't, and, and as Liz mentioned too, the models are just guesses. We, we can't predict how much rain is going to fall. We know more is going to fall, and we know there's rain coming. So how, how do we know that the, the tunnel and reservoir system is going to be adequate for Chicago? Well, we never know that any infrastructure is adequate. I mean, we're always just trying to make the most cost-effective decision, right? That's the case with everything, with, with building codes. You know, I'm from California. You could build the buildings even more earthquake-resistant, but you have to make a balance of risk, and, you know, we've, we've made a choice. I mean, Chicago is in a horrible place for stormwater. We're basically built on a swamp, right? We're built in the low spot where they portage between two watersheds, and you can't imagine a worse place in terms of water infiltration and basements than Chicago. So, you know... It's, I, I don't know the details of the deep tunnel, it's a monumental engineering project, like this amazing feat of engineering underneath our feet, you know, that was planned, but it, they're so, these projects are so long in the planning, they don't, they can't respond to changes in forecasts when it takes 20 years to get something planned and built. It really is about risk assessment, and that's what the models can tell us a lot about, so, um, I, you know, I think they do provide good guidance for the kind of things that Marcelo is doing, um, uh, you know, whether the current, you know, how, whether the current system is going to be adequate over what length of time is something I have no idea about, but, uh, but it's the kind of thing we can certainly provide some information right. to those who do want to look at that. But all these things are slow, right? Anything with infrastructure, it doesn't change overnight. These are slow projects. So, so you have to have people planning long in advance. It's a challenge. Yeah, and also, I think it's important to realize that the expectations that we should have about, you know, that these are engineered systems, and, and you design uh, the best you can, the most conservative way to actually obtain the results you want, but that doesn't mean that we are going to completely eliminate um, urban flooding. But at the same time, uh, we need to try different technologies um, that allow us to handle the water in different ways. Chicago also has a different constraint, which is that we try to minimize the amount of water that goes back into Lake Michigan because it's our main source of water, of, of fresh water. So in the, in the process of trying to do that, you, you have this balance that you need to uh, make uh, between the choice of, well, how much high or how much higher can the water get 
in the river, in the waterways, until I have to open uh, the control riverwards to let the water go into Lake uh, Michigan. So there is only so much water you can send towards Lockport, and then you have to see, well, when can I open and go out at Wilmette, or when can I go out at the lakefront by the Navy Pier? So we have constraints that uh, we have to keep in mind, so the, the system is a lot more complicated than just draining the land. And as, like I show you, if the river is too high, uh, because there is too much water reaching the river, then all those pipes that go towards the river, and there are many, many of them, hundreds, Basically, those are going to uh, back up because they have tie gates. So those tie gates, basically, they open up when the pressure coming through the pipe of the water is able to lift the weight of the tie gate. But if on this side the river is too high, the back pressure on the tie gate is enough to hold it there. So all that water that you don't see in the river showing up, it, if it came down as rain, it has to be somewhere in the, in the system. Thank you. Thank you all um, for those thoughtful um, uh, responses to the question. It is a big challenge. And I'm wondering if we think about it from, uh, Liz mentioned how there's no supercomputer in the world that could, could really compute every drop of rain, but can we understand what happens with one drop of rain? And so when it starts to where it goes and what happens with it? Well, all of the rain that falls in Chicago goes down the Mississippi, right, ultimately? Uh, that's, no, that's dollar, no dollar. Where, where, where? No dollar rain. Well, some some of it goes back to uh, to the lake sometimes. Yeah. So, yeah. but mostly we drain into the. We're in the Michigan, the Mississippi River Basin. So, so if you want to think of the life cycle, the 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 rain drain, the, the raindrop, individual little molecules. Yes. Most of them will get into the Mississippi somehow. Maybe they'll sit. Well, in the I think a lot of them get re re-evaporated. They so. will. They will. But yeah. but 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 if, they, if we have a big event, right? That she's asking, what's the life cycle? They come down, they sit in your basement for a while, they get into the Mississippi eventually, they go, they flow down, um, go join the ocean, you re-evaporate at some point, uh, goes up in the air as water vapor, uh, flows on, usually there's a net flow of water vapor from ocean to land and will fall as precipitation. That life cycle should be of order weeks for a water molecule, so constantly everything is circulating. Um, Water, water moves around a lot. You know, water is the, it's the cycle of life for the Earth, so there, it's quick. Uh, and it will go, uh, in the future, there's going to be higher fluxes, but the, because there's so much more water vapor in the atmosphere, the lifetime of water molecules in the atmosphere will actually get slightly longer. But you won't notice that. It won't make any difference to you. On this ground, all you'll see is more intense rains. Thank you. So... What I found really interesting was um, the thought of using sensors to, to start for planning, to, to plan for green infra infrastructure. And of course, wouldn't it be nice to just put some little sensors on a drop of rain as well and follow it around? <laughs> um, however, we know that's not possible. But um, also similar to, to movements just generally in cities, so moving towards smart cities, so not just for energy, but also for water to understand management of it. And I think that this is, um, it's, it's pretty much the same model where you think about some sort of distributed system. So if you think about energy, you think about water, you can have um, similar distribution systems. You need sensors to understand what's happening around it. And, um, and even storage, right? So the, the reservoirs right. are storage places for water. Are there places where, where maybe the two could be brought together, where they might be complementary? Yes. I mean, is that for me? For, uh, yes, yeah. yes. I mean, the, the question of the sensors is very, very important because the technology for measuring uh, has come down in cost, and it's an opportunity for us. There is a, a project called uh, Array of Things by, funded by National Science Foundation involving University of Chicago as well as Argon National Lab and, and Northwestern. Um, University, where basically you have these uh, poles on street corners uh, with cameras, with uh, humidity sensors, rainfall uh, uh, gauges, and the idea is that you can monitor uh, particular locations, uh, many parameters, but from the point of view of the water, you can actually see if the water is accumulating in one place or not in another. So 
the opportunities that sensor, uh, sensor technology afford us is that we are able to go at a much smaller scale and actually pinpoint, if I have a model like the ones that I show you, and that model indicates that for certain rainfall events, the water is going to accumulate on a particular part of the city, okay, it is great if we could have a sensor at a particular location that tells us just a little camera that says, yeah, actually, you know, what the model is telling you, it's, it's true or it's not true, and, and it gives you some uh, ground truth. In, but also what makes the problem in Chicago so challenging is that even though you might not see water accumulating at the street level, that doesn't mean that there is no flooding under the ground because the system could be already filled up to the rim and you just don't see it. But if you try to use the facilities at your home, you know, the water might back up into, into, your, um, into your house and you could have basement flooding. So having sensor technology, for instance, along the Chicago River, we should have a certain, a different locations. We should have sensors that tell us what is the water level, how is the water level fluctuating, changing during a storm, what is the flow of water. We have a major asset on, in the river. And now we have the, the magnificent river walk. Well, the river walk now gives us another constraint because it has a certain elevation. So you don't want during a big storm for the water to actually get over the level of the river walk. So how do you have to operate the system, the gates and whatnot, uh, to be able to maintain the water below that level, to be able to maintain recreation and navigation, all the, ni the nice mm -hmm. things that we like to do. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a major proposal with Charlie Catlett, who's mm -hmm. developed the array of things, which is putting all these sensors all over the city of Chicago. Uh, where we're trying to combine those observations with very detailed modeling and feeding that all into global information system analysis that can then provide the city with real-time kind of information, of hope eventually. <laughs> it's going to take a while. Uh, but that's the idea, is to, to get to that point so that then the city and, and engineers like Marcelo can then really be able to use... Uh, information much more in a much shorter period of time in, in the future. Great. From a climate perspective, I just want to remind you that, um, you know, our, our view of the world is um, there are things that we're, we've, we're learning uh, rapidly now as we develop better observational capacity. So the, the ground truth precipitation that I showed you, the map that was on the lower uh, left-hand side, those radar, that radar database has only been available for about 10 years. We just didn't have the radar coverage and the mm -hmm. capability to actually know what was happening overall in the United States. You know, and it's as amazing as it sounds, all we had were gauges, where literally sometimes it's like a bucket fills up and then tips over and says, okay, now I've tipped over one bucket of water. So, so we are getting a much finer grained picture of, of the climate system and our country than we had before. And it's also the same time period when the models, even though they can't go down to raindrop scale, but they're getting to where you, you're getting something that looks very much like actual weather. And so it's the first time in, in really uh, in history where we started to see the climate and the weather scales come together. So I do think it's actually a real growth area uh, for science because it's exactly the time when we're starting to get more observational spatial temporal fields at that scale and our simulations are starting to get down to that scale. So it's a very rich, it's a very rich time period for us. Both, Liz, both you and, and uh, Don led right into my final question, which was um, where can science and technology fo focus so that we have better understanding? But also, I guess, if I had to ask, uh, maybe you already answered it, both of you, and I'll, I'll let Marcelo answer as well. So what is it that you don't know, um, even though that's a little bit of the uncertainty question as well, that you would like to know, and how do we get that information? So. I, I hear real-time data is, is important, um, and now just even having access to that kind of information. Is there anything else that science and technology should really be focusing on in order to, to really break through and, and, and have a better understanding so that we can have more, um, maybe faster responses, perhaps? Well, I, do I go? Or you? No, go ahead. <laughs> I just want to do my, my usual pitch as somebody who's an atmospheric scientist is that... Uh, 
we're moving into an era where instead of just simulating change, we should be watching it because it's happening. I mean, the simulations are remarkably consistent in their general predictions, but there's no substitute like watching reality. And since we haven't fixed the CO2 issue, we're gonna see some changes. And it is actually a time when we are reducing our observational capacity from space. Uh, we will have fewer sensors, satellite-borne sensors, in the that's upcoming true. decades than we have now. So we are actually at kind of a high point for what we can see from space. And that's just a sin, you know, because here we are. We only have one planet. It's undergoing this unprecedented change. We have the technology, and we're just literally not bothering to replace things that are up there. And that's a real crisis for science because... Once the time period is passed, you can't go back and say you want to remeasure. So this is actually a call your congressman issue to emphasize that we need to be monitoring. Yeah, my my uh, my thinking. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it must have been a really bad idea, but uh, what I was about to say. But, no, my. Uh, my um, motivation is actually to try to have something that is, like I mentioned, a hydrologic uh, observatory. I think we need something like that, that you can get academic institutions, uh, different groups, NGOs, and you have a, a point where um, all the data that is being collected through a sensor uh, network can be actually put to use and we can couple it with uh, weather uh, models. Uh, we are collaborating with colleagues from Notre Dame that tell us that uh, pretty soon they're gonna be able to give us at least precipitation at daily precipitation. They're not gonna give us hourly or by the minute, but at least just having that, being able to use that as an input to a model in order to make more of long-term predictions, not prediction as at the scale of the storm itself or the event itself, I think that's very, very important. If we could have a, a, a network of sensors that basically are all connected and, and different groups, uh, the science that we need to have to begin to understand how we can improve these deterministic models as well as, as, well as new models based, let's say, on artificial intelligence or machine learning, how can we do that? Because those allow us to run much faster but you need to train them, and the way to train them is with deterministic models, like the ones that I show you. So I think that that's really important to invest on that, on yeah. bringing, bringing groups together in that sense. What we're gonna see, and my thinking was much along the same lines, is that what we're gonna see is a much more integration across disciplines, mm -hmm. uh, scientists, engineers, social scientists, where we try to look at observations, modeling, and uh, information flow um, much more integrated than we have in the past and you know certainly that's the direction we're trying to take uh, a lot of our scientific analyses and I think we're going to see a lot more of that in the future. Great. Okay, I know I have lots more questions but I do want to leave some time for the audience to ask some questions too. So we'll take some time now. Um, we have quite a few hands. Wait for the mic please. And if you could stand up and Maybe say your name and where you're from so that we have an idea. Um, thank you for your presentation. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for your presentation. Um, my name is Samana. I'm originally from Iran. And I had a question. You mentioned like how the global warming contributes to extreme storms. Uh, I wanted to take it a step backwards, like what is contributing to the global warming, one of them would be the fossil fuels, and how oil fracking is contributing to many of the earthquakes, which is also a natural disaster. And considering, well, m many of the recent uh, uh, earthquakes we've had in the Middle East, uh, namely Iran, do you think that the oil extraction of the ground has contributed to that? And my second question is, considering the um, political oppression of some of these environmental groups and scientists involved in renewable technologies and climate change, how can that be resolved? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um. So uh, 
I had a, the National Academy of Sciences invited me to meet with Iranian scientists uh, last December, uh, and it was a group of US scientists I met with Iranian scientists, towards keeping the uh, exchange of information flowing in, in, the, in the sciences, and, we, and, and this was aimed particularly at looking at the environment. Um, Iran does have some very major issues happening because of, that relate partially to, to water use, but also because of these changes that are occurring that um, are leading to kind of the wet get wetter and the dry get drier around the world. And, um, and as a result, we're seeing much more concerns about um, droughts in, in certain parts of the world. And that is related in part to climate change, but it also relates to how water is used. Uh, and so we, I think as, a, as human society in general, uh, we need to be much more thoughtful about how we're using water and what and how it's distributed. And uh, uh, that's really going to be another big area of, of uh, analyses and change, I think, over the, over the next decade. I can just echo that and say Iran is in a critical uh, mode of unsustainable groundwater extraction. We, even without climate change, this is a real problem for there's some of the countries in the, in the Near East and Middle East, and Iran in particular, is, is, is really quite a looming danger. Um, the seismic stuff, I mean, it's, it's a, always been a seismic zone there, so I wouldn't blame oil extraction on that. Most of the oil extraction earthquakes are pretty small by California standards, you know, where we come, we're like, ah, four, you know, you care about a four. So, so Iran's earth seismicity is, is, is global tectonics, and, but, but the groundwater extraction is, is something that's gonna become a geopolitical issue. Great. We have a question online. Uh, when and how did the expression 100-year floods originate? <laughs> It's, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing looking at, you hear about one, the one in 500 year floods or the one in 500 year droughts and so forth, but the actual information we have to go into those is not a long enough time scale to know what is a one in 100 year flood. So uh, it's, uh, so it's there, there's some basis for it, but a lot of it is just kind of made up too. But just, just as a definition, the 100-year flood is supposed to be the level of flooding that recurs on average once every 100 years. But you don't have 100 years of data to predict that from, even no. in the present distribution. So it's very difficult to predict out of the edges. And then if you're, if you're not stationary, if your distributions are changing, then it's really quite difficult. So, so there is a technical meaning to it that's quite sound, but you can't take 50 years of data and accurately predict your 100-year your flood level. Yeah, essentially, that's one explanation. The other one is, well, it has a probability of occurring of 1% yeah, yeah. on every, yeah, on every yeah, any yeah. year. The, what is very confusing, I think, for, for people, for the public, is the fact that you say, well, it's a 100-year flood, but the 2008 um, storm uh, produced downstream in, on the Illinois River produced a flow, or a hydrograph, that was very, very similar to the 2013 uh, storm. So then you said, but wait a minute. You told me a minute ago that 2008 was a 100 year uh, event. And then, uh, you know, a few years later, we have, five years later, we have an event that gives us the same uh, flow. So from the point of view of the rain, a 10 year, a 10 -year uh, rainfall event doesn't amount to a 10 year flood because it depends also a lot of the antecedent conditions or, or what you have here. It's as a, from the point of view of engineering, we use that term, like we, you're designing a levy, and you say, I'm going to design this levy for, to be effective up to a 500 year flat level. Well, that level is a statistical definition that you reach, analyzing data the best you can, and essentially extrapolating to yep. figure out where that level is gonna be. Now, that doesn't mean that you might not get a particular storm like the 93 flood in the Mississippi or the 2011 flood on the Mississippi, and, and then the water gets over, over the level of the levee, and then the whole concept of so many years of uh, recurrence uh, basically goes um, out the window. 
we, we do get asked in the climate community all the time to, to come up with what would be the one in a hundred year event. And, and we just always have to say we don't have enough data to know whether exactly what that would mean. You can get recurrence intervals better when you get a simulation, right? Because you can run some simulations you can run for a thousand years, but, but that doesn't help you understand the actual distribution. And precip is so local and so complicated that you don't want to make those kind of predictions from a model. You want to do it from observations. Great. Should we go on to the next question, please? I'm supposed to stand. Uh, my name is Howard Zarr. I used to be a geophysicist, also an EPA employee. Um, you've been pretty persuasive that we need a lot of work on models and on uh, monitoring and on simulation just in the Chicago area and that the dangers in the Chicago area are substantial. Uh, so it seems like a lot of resources are going to be needed to build things and to study things and so on. And given uh, the appetite for that sort of thing in the current body politic, how are, how are, you, how are we going to find the funds for all of that, do you think? Do you have any politicians that are interested in, in the kinds of things you've been saying? You, you're asking me? Well, you can start. That would be fine. Yeah. Yes. Well, listen, I'm a, I'm a tenured professor at the University of Illinois, and I... I um, not only I do enjoy doing research, but I enjoy uh, solving problems. And the harder they are, the more interesting they are. So I think that what we need to convince uh, the powers to be about supporting is, is one important aspect. But I think that the dynamics of the whole system is such that you need to, you need to do something, and one way or another, these activities uh, have to be, they have to be funded because you, you saw the claims, for instance, for insurance, they're huge. So we have a FEMA, we have a federal emergency management uh, system that, that doesn't quite work because if, what, what makes Chicago so complicated is unless you go to the Des Plaines River where you have a flat plain, the Chicago River doesn't have a flat plain. There is no flat plain, it's an unconventional river. Uh, the North Branch has a bit of a flat plain as you go north then into Lake County. So how do you convince people that this is worthwhile uh, supporting? Well, that is a challenge, obviously, but it's no different than anything else. You know, Why is it important to invest on trying to maintain uh, Chicago um, uh, free of flooding, or free of issues dealing with water. Well, because the the city was born by Lake Michigan, and the Chicago River was the main uh, the main viable uh, uh, route to go in and out, and for commerce uh, to grow. So I don't know who is going to fund uh, this. Uh, we have been uh, very fortunate to have the support of MWRD for the things that, that we have done, and I'd like to believe that we have helped uh, the agency and we have helped uh, Chicago in general uh, with our work. But it's part of the challenge of convincing someone, uh, you know, for instance, to fund a Chicago hydrologic observatory. Well, there are many things that could be uh, funded, but you know, it's the same way that why do you find an institute for sustainability? Well, because you want to learn about what is the science that is needed and the research that is needed to make things uh, sustainable. So that's, for instance, a word that doesn't get used a lot in Chicago, sustainability. You know, So do we think that the way we are going is sustainable? And the feeling is that, yeah, we, we want to have our cake and we want to eat it too. So... It's a, it's, it's a symbiosis with, with water that we have here, that the city has, both with the lake and the river, that it's unavoidable not to address all the issues associated with, uh, with extreme uh, storm events. Yeah, that's a very complicated question to, to address. Uh, science and technology have certainly played a major role in making um, our nation what it is today. And I think we do have a Congress that is generally supportive of science and technology. Uh, we have a current administration that would 
um, that essentially has called for the elimination of, of funding of, or a great reduction in funding of research connected with uh, anything related to the environment. Um, but so far, Congress hasn't really gone along with that. We'll see what happens over the next one or two years. We have time for one more question. Hi, uh, I'm a civil engineer, uh, specialized in uh, site civil stuff in Chicago. So, and actually the question uh, online prefaces one perfectly, where I was, I was always curious when you're looking at Bulletin 70 and you're designing to the 100 year um, uh, storm, that if we only have 50 or 100 years at the most, how, how much confidence do we have in that? And following up to that, when you look at Bulletin 70, and you see the uh, likelihood of extreme storms increasing, is there ever gonna be you know, an increase? And in, I think right now it's 100 years, like 7.58 inches or something. Are, are we ever gonna increase everything by 10%, by 15%? And if so, when do you think that would happen? So, so it's hard to get those recurrence intervals even with the historical data and then obviously you know, when the probabilities are changing in the future, you're going to have to update them, and this is a huge issue, is how do we update sort of engineering guidelines that people depend on for big money decisions. Um, to some extent, you know, if we really cared as a society, and I don't know how much this is being done, we would try to use models as best we can to, to just, you know, come to some consensus on, on new intervals, but it's, it's, it's a huge project because we can't wait and get another 40 years of data and say, okay, now we have a new sense of at least a new estimate that's as good as the last one of the 100-year flood. So, so all of these shifting probability distributions are making a huge pain for engineers everywhere. And it's not just water, it's you know, the guys who lay the asphalt surfaces who have to predict the, the temperature of the maximum heat wave beyond which you know, the cars get stuck in the asphalt. There's all kinds of building standards and construction standards that depend on having some sense of these you know, the probabilities of certain thresholds. And, and as that shifts, it just it makes a lot of engineering projects really challenging. So some things like the one in 20 year event, we have a pretty good handle on. Mm -hmm. And we can uh, then say, well, what's, you know, 20, 50 years from now, what's, you know, that same one in 20 year event might be a one in five year event. Mm -hmm. um, but when we go to the one in 100 year event or the one in 500 year event, there's no real data to base it on. So you can kind of estimate it mm -hmm and extrapolate as, as Marcella mentioned earlier, but, uh, and, and, and we kind of do that and then likewise say, well, what's that likely to be in the future? But they're really pretty rough estimates. Yeah, I, but as a follow up, I think that we, we also need to keep in mind that we are relatively young, both uh, as a country, as a city, I serve for, four years on a committee for the city of Florence in Italy. Florence in 1966, flooded real bad. Uh, the Arno River just burst, uh, took all the bridges except the Ponte Vecchio, which was got damaged very, very badly. So, 2016 was the 50th anniversary of that, and, and we went there as an international committee. Um, Jerry Galloway was the other person uh, representing the U.S to try to come up with a plan that could get implemented to increase the level of protection of Florence, because Florence is due for another uh, flood, and, and now the river cannot really carry the amount of water that it carried in 1966. So it's very, very difficult, and this goes back to the previous question too, to convince the politicians in Italy that this uh, should be done rather quickly, take measures, on the other hand, thanks to the flood of 1966, all the art in Florence got ruined, including the Cimabue um, at Santa Croce, and the Italians became the top people in the world at restoring uh, books that have got wet and uh, works of art that have got wet. They became the, the, the people to be due to the flood. So something good came out of the flood, but if you walk around Florence, you're going to find, find flood marks from 1547, from 1580, the, the, the levels of the water mark on, uh, on the walls of the houses. And I have read a book, there is a book by a professor from Dartmouth that um, Da Vinci had a plan to create a bypass again, again, around Florence. 
to basically deviate the water together. And then with Machiavelli, they have another plan to actually take the Arno away from Pisa, who was their rival, essentially. So if you, if you go to the river today, you're going to see all these weirs, the Pescaye. And the only reason why they, they build them and people use them for recreation and these days was to prevent the enemy to come with boats, basically, from downstream and to get into the city. That was the whole purpose of having that. The drawback of that is that that's a major piece of resistance to the flow because the water needs to go above this Pescaye. So now when you have a big flat, that plays against you. So it's all a give and take. And we, we came up with a report, a book published by University of Florence. Now, whether or not they're going to take action and do the things they need to do in the watershed up above to uh, protect uh, Florence, which is a world treasure, um, uh, by the way, we don't know. But anywhere, it's difficult to convince people that, yeah, that this, this could happen again. So my understanding is one standard that did get changed in Chicago already, and that's the tree species they've adjusted. They're planning for the 50-year temperature, so they'll plant different, more, more temper yeah. heat, heat tough trees in Chicago. So this municipal, whatever agency it is that plants all those urban trees has made that exact forecast. You know, they just have to do something. And trees last a long time, so you can't yeah, plant today's tree. You have to plant yeah, trees. The, the Morton Harbor region is helping them a lot with that yeah. type of analysis. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming.